organizers for uh, inviting me to this uh, wonderful workshop, even the weather's worked out. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, it's a, a special opportunity because uh, basically I'm new to this field and uh, it was a great chance to learn what's going on and what people are doing. And this is basically my uh, first uh, try at a work at, at the top, at this field. And uh, it's uh, unfortunately at the moment not yet uh, finished and of course not published yet. So uh, I greatly appreciate your opinion about whether it's interesting or not. So uh, actually the, the story of my work is uh, related to this picture. I don't know if any of you uh, know where that is, but that's uh, uh, the physics department at the University of Connecticut. And I was a visitor there. And uh, during my visit, there was a talk by uh, Eric Ackerman, Professor Eric Ackerman from the Technion, who talked about fractals, about quantum fields on fractals. And listening to his talk, I uh, had some ideas maybe that could be related to FMO states. And that's the basic idea behind this work. And later on, they were renovating re the physics department, uh, the, the building. And I noticed that they also thought there was some connection but because they have this analysis on fractals and ultra-cold molecules. Mm -hmm. So maybe <coughs> somebody thought about it before. So I'll try to convince you in this talk that there is uh, seemingly some, con there is, is some connection between these seemingly unconnected uh, uh, fields, FM of states, which are three-body universal states, and uh, fields on fractals. So to do so, I'll start with a brief introduction. I'll tell you things you already know about FEMOF states. Then I'll talk about discrete scaling functions, hints on some mathematical connections. And then uh, I'll go on to describe uh, uh, some work on obtaining FEMOF states uh, via uh, effective field theory, which was done by some people in the audience. Uh, I'll talk about the Neumann series solution of the integral equation conditions for discrete scaling. And then I'll discuss about how to obtain the scaling parameters. And I'll try to connect them to one dimensional physics. Uh, and then identify the fractal uh, structure uh, uh, connected to this. And if I have time, uh, I'm not sure, I'll go into wild speculations and I'll summarize. So um, FMO states started in 1970 when uh, Vitaly Efimov discovered uh, the limit where when the scattering length diverges. Uh, on the negative side, there are no uh, two-body bound states, but there are an uh, infinite number of three-body trimer states. And like any, uh, or like many important uh, discovery discoveries in physics, uh, his uh, result, as he is quoted as saying, went from questionable to pathological to exotic to a hot topic. And well, after um, Efimov made his prediction, people tried to start looking for Efimov states in experiments. There were experiments done in helium-4, in nucleons, in triton, in helium-3, halo nuclei. And as uh, is typically the case, uh, uh, Efimov states were finally uh, experimentally uh, detected in cold atoms, which are uh, a good system to see a lot of physics. And this was done with cesium atoms in Innsbruck. So what are the proper properties of FMOF trimers, which I will be looking, about, uh, looking at? Well, there are uh, three uh, body universal. Universal, well, it depends on, on your, the way you define things, because they're, they don't only depend on the scattering length. They, they also depend on a further parameter. So some people call them universal. Some people do not. And details of the short range interactions become irrelevant. There are infinitely many bound states. There's a discrete scaling where the energy scales like uh, lambda to the minus two and uh, the size, uh, uh, the, <coughs> the scales like lambda and uh, scattering amplitudes for the atom dimer can, uh, there are many log periodic functions in this. So actually the FEMOF spectrum manifests many of the, the uh, properties I will be discussing. Uh, there's the discrete symmetry, there's uh, the infinite spectrum, and there's the universality where uh, FM of uh, spectrum is defined only by two parameters, uh, lambda naught and kappa. 
kappa star, three body parameter. And now I'll make a switch turn to um, functions where, with a discrete scaling invariance. So basically a fractal is an iterative structure. For instance, the counter set where you take a segment, you divide it into three pieces, you uh, delete the, the middle piece, and you continue doing this, you get a fractal, or the diamond fractals where you just connect each two points by a further curve, and you get this structure, or by two curves, and you get this structure. Uh, the Koch curve, where you take each segment and you grow a further triangle in the middle. So these are iterative structures. But fractals can be very fancy. And here we have an example of a few fractals. Uh, these are by uh, famous Dutch uh, artist Asher, And these are the most photogenic uh, fractals, the Mendelbrot set. But this is basically a commercial. So uh, what you see is not going to be connected to any product you're going to get at the end. So. Uh, now for an uh, equation with a uh, discrete symmetry. So an equation with a discrete symmetry uh, um, <coughs> satisfies the following uh, equation, where a and b are the scaling parameters, and g is some initial function. And the solution to this is of the following form. And basically, this is one of the hints that I, I've uh, made me think about the connection of this to Efimov states, because uh, you see that you have a log periodic function here, which you also have in Efimov states. And later on, we'll discuss this. So uh, a different way to obtain solutions to this equation is just to uh, iterate it. So uh, as a first uh, iteration, you take g. Then you take 1 over b, g of a of x, and so on, so forth. You get this uh, uh, series of iterated functions. <coughs> as far as I know, these are the only solutions. And then this iterated procedure will give you uh, Yeah. Okay. And so now let's look at the, well, the spectrum or the poles. You, we take the uh, iterative solution. We uh, perform something called a Mellon transform on it, which is uh, the analog of a Fourier transform for functions with discrete symmetry. And uh, you look at the, uh, the Mellon transform, and you see that there are a set of infinite number of poles. So this is another connection that you, you see that the spectrum of these uh, uh, discrete functions is uh, infinite. So now, basically, these are the basic hints to the connection between the, the two uh, topics. So uh, for FMO states, we have discrete symmetry and uh, limit cycle RG. Uh, the same for fields on fractals. We have log periodic functions, log periodic functions, uh, infinite spectrum, and uh, infinite number of poles. And now I go to uh, this uh, very nice work uh, described below, uh, which obtained uh, FMO physics through uh, effective field theory. So you take a three body uh, bosonic field theory, you introduce a uh, uh, D-baryon or D-atom uh, field, you write it in terms of this, uh, of this field, which is uh, addressing of the D-atom propagator, you basically obtain an integral equation for the scattering amplitude, where uh, D-atom can break up into two atoms and create another D-atom, or it can scatter against an atom. And this is the integral equation you, you obtain for this. This is the uh, kernel for this uh, integral equation. <coughs> now, uh, uh, you can look at the homogeneous equation, uh, which is written here. And the ansatz is looking for a power, power law solution. So you introduce this power law solution inside. Uh, two things I'd like you to notice is, is one, when you introduce this power law inside, uh, basically you have q to the power of s over Q, so this turns into a Mellon transform of this uh, 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 log. That's one thing. And basically, uh, the other thing that was obtained in this work is once you do this, uh, um, you take this ansatz for the solution, uh, instead of obtaining an, a continuous symmetry, you obtain a discrete symmetry, where uh, the discrete symmetry is the fact that you have only specific, specific values for uh, S. 
and, and doing this, you get the scattering amplitude for the atom dimer uh, in terms of some cutoff. So now I would like to look at this problem a bit differently. I would like to take the integral equation and just write out a formal uh, Neumann series solution of it in the following form, where uh, the psi's are given just by these integrals. And what I'd like to do is to, uh, to take this uh, uh, formal solution that I had before and have it uh, of, this, of this shape. Because this is the form we saw is the, the solution to the, uh, the iterative solution to the uh, discrete scaling function. Remember, we had some b to the power of n and some uh, scaling of, of uh, x, which was a to the power of n. And I'd like, to, I'd like the, so the, form, the formal sol uh, Neumann solution of this to be uh, equivalent to this. So the condition can be found to take this solution and bring it to this form if the um, integral of two of these equals to the integral of one kernel where uh, p is multiplied by this uh, function. Yeah? Because of the speed, but why is lambda 2 over pi? Well, lambda is 2 over pi just because it's the, uh, it's the, uh, it's sort of the eigenvalue in the, in the problem. So the original problem was, uh, that's the prefactor for the integral. And uh, so now uh, we have a connection. So if, if this con con uh, uh, condition is satisfied, then uh, the uh, scattering amplitude is basically of this form. And this form is this, the, the form of the solution of an uh, uh, iterative uh, discrete scaling uh, function. And you can uh, map this uh, uh, gamma to, to A before we had before. And you can map this lambda to B, which we had before in the uh, general uh, description for an iterative solution. Now, uh, we have some remaining questions. So, so what are these values of, how do we obtain these values of these scaling parameters for the iterative solution, A and B? Uh, how do we obtain the FMO spectrum? And uh, if I'm trying to convince you this is some sort of fractal, what is the fractal behind this? Uh, so one way, the difficult way of obtaining this uh, scaling function is just to take uh, the, the Mellon transform, as I uh, described to you here, of this equation, both sides of the equation. And it turns out that uh, uh, this is, uh, gives you that uh, this scaling parameter to the power of minus s is just the Mellon transform of the kernel I, I showed you before times uh, p. So uh, remember. Remember here, when we, we uh, looked for a, so a solution of, of uh, uh, power law, p to the power of s, then we inserted this here. So we had q to the power of s minus 1, which was the Mellon transform of the kernel times uh, q. So we have the same sort of uh, condition here. So this is one. This is. Uh, uh, the condition which we get from the iterative solution uh, condition. And from the other side, we know that the uh, Mellon transform is equal to B. Uh, if this is not clear, I'll, I'll show it in a, a much more simple way in, in, in the next slide. So comparing the two, we see that the conditions are that A to the power of S uh, times B has to equal 1. So this is the condition that uh, um, this is a <coughs> the integral equation will become uh, an equation of the, the form of an uh, iterative solution of a discrete scaling function. And so here we see that uh, before when I introduced to you the iterative solutions of uh, a, a discrete scaling, there were two parameters, A and B, and they were not connected. There was no connection between them. Here we see that there is a connection between them. And uh, moreover, we saw before that there were an uh, infinite number of poles, Sn, and here we know from the FMO physics that there are only uh, two values, plus and minus S0. So let's, let's see what I told you uh, in, in a much simpler way. So what I'm trying to 
say is that the uh, scattering amplitude is, uh, it has a discrete scale invariance. That means that if I take uh, the scattering amplitude of A times P, it's B, this uh, uh, scaling parameter, times the uh, uh, scattering amplitude. So now if I try again the uh, power-like solution to the homogeneous equation, uh, and I insert it here, I get this condition again. So it's the same condition I got before, just uh, using Mellon, Mellon transforms. Uh. So now I hope I have convinced you that the FEM of physics can be related to uh, the physics of, uh, uh, of discrete scaling functions. And I want to um, uh, go a step forward, forward and connect these to Bloch states on, on a lattice and to obtain the FM of uh, spectrum from uh, bohr sommerfeld quantization. So the, the uh, solution to, an, uh, to a function with a, a, a discrete uh, scaling invariance was of the form p to the minus m, uh, some periodic function with a period of 1 of log p over log a. Now I will try to look at uh, uh, and this m, sorry, is, is log b over log a. These are the two parameters of the scaling function. Uh, so I will change coordinates. This will be important also later to logarithmic coordinates where log p is x tilde. I'll denote this m as i k, uh, or k as i m, or m as minus i k. And then the, the, the formal solution to the uh, iterative uh, scaling function has a form of a uh, Bloch wave function. So we have e to the power of k x tilde, which is this uh, log, and we have some uh, periodic function of x tilde over uh, uh, some uh, lattice constant, will, which will be the log of this uh, other parameter, a. Uh, another way of looking at the same, the same thing is just going back to this. Uh, uh, so, so we saw that uh, in the Mellon transform, we have an infinite number of poles of this form. But here, we saw that to connect this to, th to the FMO physics, we need only, uh, there, there are only uh, two solutions, plus and minus uh, is naught. So basically, we have uh, one solution with a plus and one solution with a minus, where is naught equals two. Uh, la, uh, minus lan log of b over uh, log of a and 2 pi n over log of a. So we, we again associate the wave number k to this first part and uh, we associate uh, l as the lattice constant to, th to the log of this parameter and now uh, we can basically look at s naught as uh, an effective uh, uh, quasi-momentum in a crystal. So S0 is equal to K plus 2 pi N over uh, L, which is the lattice constant. And now I, I would like to uh, obtain through this analogy the, the uh, FM of, uh, oh, let me uh, just. So what happens to the larger N complex solution? So you just chose N for one, so actually, uh, um, the, um, basically, this A will be not only one lattice constant. It will be, you, you could have many lattice constants. So you, you, you have this periodic, uh, it will, I hope it will become clearer in the future. But you, you can add, uh, well, basically what you're doing in the, in the, uh, the FEMO physics is it's invariant to multiplying by A, the, 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 the X. But I'm going to logarithmic uh, co coordinates, so that would be adding a's. So it will be invariant to adding a's, which will basically be multiplying a by, the, by uh, a constant. So you, will th you have a lattice, which, is, uh, which is, has a lattice constant a, and you're just adding many uh, lattice constants to it. I hope it will become clearer in a minute or so. So just, uh, again, taking this... Uh, uh, formal solution of the uh, iterative equation, since this is a, 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 
a function uh, um, uh, I can expand this function in terms of uh, plane waves and and we I, I keeping only two terms I get this uh, uh, cosine uh, of the scattering amplitude so now I, I would like to show you how to get the FM of spectrum in this in, in this uh, Analo analogy I'm using. So the way to get the FM of spectrum is just uh, through the bohr summerfield quantization, which tells us you have to integrate over a closed loop of the momentum dqi, and you get 2 pi n. So here I, I'm integrating only one direction from uh, x tilde 1 to x tilde. And as I showed you before, the analog of the momentum here is S0, which is the quasi-momentum on, on this lattice. The dxi is basically just, uh, e e sorry, dx tilde, dx tilde, x tilde was just basically uh, log of p. So from this uh, relationship, we get that log of p, this is just x tilde at the, at the end value minus x tilde at the initial value, which is some boundary condition, gives you that uh, log of p is n pi over s naught, and from this we can get the, the FM of spectrum. Now, a further question is, is, is that bothered me was, what is the fractal that's uh, uh, related to this? So you can't do much in a one-dimensional uh, geometry to get a fractal. You can take a line and you can just make it longer, but that's not very interesting. So you take a line and you add a longer line, and, and that doesn't help you much. It's not an interesting fractal. Uh, so uh, the answer this, to this question I got with one one of my collaborators, I was working with a few people in, in University of Connecticut. They all disappeared uh, during the summer, and only one of them from mathematics was left. There's a group there working on, on uh, fractals, and uh, he came up with the idea that this is basically just a spiral, which is uh, not as fancy a fractal as I showed you at the beginning, but still uh, you could look at it as a sort of fractal. So what you take is you take some piece, and uh, you, you stretch it and bend it, and you stretch it and bend it, and that's how you get the fractal uh, corresponding to this. So this is basically the spiral is defined by A, which is some complex number to the power of T, which is real, and this just gives you the, uh, this geometry. So uh, just looking at it here, so you, you have A to the power of minus S, or minus I S naught, and uh, bringing uh, a to the exponent, you, you, you can parameter, parameterize uh, A by some A to the power of T by some distance along the curve. A and you see basically that if you want to get real values, you need that uh, uh, the log of A, the absolute value of A, uh, a and uh, theta naught will have uh, integer uh, ratios. So let me, let me try and explain the same thing, uh, not geometrically, but uh, on a different way. Um, we saw before that uh, a to the power minus s times b is 1. b is real. We saw it was 2, pi over, uh, 2 over pi. But there's a phase. But a, it seems that a can have a phase. So I write this uh, scaling uh, parameter a as e to the i theta naught, which is some phase, plus uh, these uh, uh, terms, which is 2 pi n over s naught and l. So m taking a to the power of i s naught, these, these two will just give you 1 because this is just 2 pi uh, i. And, this will, uh, and the condition is that uh, this is the lattice constant. So uh, e to the power of i l s naught will be 1. And what about the phase? The phase is determined by the fact that we have two solutions. Basically, it's not a spiral. It, it, it's not. <coughs> Maybe I should. Uh, basically, what this shows us that, that this, these Bloch uh, functions are just, instead of plane waves on a, on a lattice, they're plane waves on the, in the uh, complex plane. But we have two of them. We have one coming in and one coming out. Uh, uh, so essentially, uh, these two solutions give us this condition that the hyperbolic cosine of S naught times the phase of A has to equal B. Or uh, in a different way, it's just uh, we see here that uh, the imaginary part 
of log a, which is the phase of a, has to equal b, and the real part has to equal 1, which gives you the condition that basically the real part of, uh, or the, the amplitude of a is just the, the lattice constant. So a uh, takes on values of 2 pi n times uh, uh, s naught, which is the, the, the momentum. And, uh, well, I don't know if I want to get into wild speculations because these are, are not, uh, but uh, the fact is, th the question is, can this help us to get uh, uh, the three-body parameter? So I haven't discussed the three-body parameter up to now in this analogy. And the idea is uh, that uh, actually we have uh, the bohr summerfield uh, rules, are, uh, we have a phase which depends on the boundary conditions, the initial boundary conditions. So uh, what I'd like is to obtain this, this phase, and this phase uh, basically determines uh, uh, the uh, three-body parameter from, from the uh, FMO spectrum relation. And uh, what I hope to do, and uh, I haven't succeeded so far, is to obtain this phase as a non-trivial geometrical phase on a lattice. There's, there's a, a work by uh, uh, Professor Zach from the Technion, which is sort of closes a loop because it, the work started with somebody from the Technion. And at the end, I hope to end it with another person from the Technion, but I'm not sure this could be achieved. And he, he saw that you can get uh, uh, a non-trivial geometrical phase on a lattice. And I, I, I hope that this could be connected to the uh, boundary conditions on these uh, wave functions. So to summarize, I, uh, I obtained a known, a known result through a different formalism, through an uh, analogy. I don't know if that's interesting or not. It sheds some light on the connections between uh, not fields on fractals, but actually functions with uh, um, uh, discrete uh, scale symmetry and the SKM equation. And you could look at it as a realization of a quantum field on a fractal, which uh, hasn't been observed uh, experimentally. So thank you very much. Questions? <coughs> yeah, so if I remember correctly, Shima, you have also considered a spiral uh, and yes, found yes. that there is some ephemeral effect, right? It's a more complicated than ephemeral effect. OK, oh yeah, more complicated. I, I didn't quite understand um, what, what you want to get to with this uh, Zach uh, phase. So this, this should you want to just connect the Efimov parameter to this picture, or do you, uh, you think you can predict it from? Uh, I, I hope to. I, I hope to predict it from something like the, the Zach phase. So the Zach phase is, is some uh, geometrical phase which you get on a uh, on a lattice. Uh, if you if you go through the whole uh, uh, band. So, so it's, it's a topological sort of uh, thing. And I hope to get it here because there's, there's no physical boundary conditions on this, uh, this program. So it has to come from some boundary condition. But uh, there's no, no, no physical boundary condition here. So uh, there are some similarities which I hope to. to uh, so, so I. So would I, that I, mean in the end that kappa star is not a free parameter anymore? Uh, it will it will depend on on it. Sh it should be obtained by some. Yeah, it w would not be a free parameter, I guess. But what can it depend on? I mean, if you can calculate it, what will be your input parameter? Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, it has to. There, there's nothing added here that I, I can. I mean, it's a dimensionful quantity, right? So it has to depend on some other dimensionful quantity. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm not sure about how, where where that would come from. Once you, when you have this STM equation, which 
Mm -hmm. The integral in the momentum space. Yeah. You have a cutoff number. Yeah. Which basically can determine this kappa star. So do you have some similar cutoff in this? Uh, so so yeah, I haven't discussed the cutoff. The cutoff basically is is some boundary condition uh, at uh, so. Obtaining this was done without a boundary condition, so, so I was ignoring this phase, but this phase should come from the boundary condition. So it might be re related to the cutoff, but... Uh, so, so this would be some finite size of your lattice? Or? Yeah, so the, the, the wave function will not go to, to infinity, or, or it would get some non-trivial phase from infinity. Yeah, so P goes to X. So, so P is the, the, the coordinate. Momentum lattice, and then if you have like a, a finite volume, the momentum lattice that would correspond to a short distance cutoff. Yeah, I'm trying to make yeah. a connection to the usual picture. Other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. So we have uh, the informal discussion in the afternoon at 3.30 and uh, Professor Aaron Brown will give a, a, a seminar.